Welcome to MLST. Today we are extremely excited to have two distinguished guests join us. The first guest is Ellie Pavlik. She is an assistant professor of computer science at Brown University and a research scientist at Google AI. Her work focuses on building better computational models of natural language semantics and pragmatics, aiming to help computers understand language the way humans do. Our second guest, the legendary Raphael Millier, is the 2020 Robert A. Burt Presidential Scholar in Science and Neuroscience in the Centre for Science and Society and a lecturer in the Philosophy Department at Columbia University. Raphael completed his um, DPhil in Philosophy from the University of Oxford, where his work centred on self-consciousness and his main interests lie in the philosophy of artificial intelligence, cognitive science and the mind. Now, this is an interesting experiment for us. We've decided to get these two heavyweights uh, just one-on-one -on -one having a conversation with each other and we're hosting it here on MLST. They spoke about compositionality and grounding, compositional generalization benchmarks, mechanistic understanding in language models, variable binding in transformers, language and vision models, compositional behavior in humans, compositional reasoning and negation in language models, variable binding in reinforcement learning and transformers, the difference between instruction tuning and RLHF, and the benefits of RLHF, referential grounding and language models. And yeah, the Chomsky skepticism, of course, you know, our friend Stephen Piantadosi's paper, inductive biases and language uh, learning, language models in different languages, and indeed the future of academic work in language models. Now, the audio from Raphael in particular wasn't as good as it could be. I've done my very best to process it and improve it. Just to help folks follow along, I've kind of generated some subtitles. The subtitles on Google are absolutely rubbish. Um, speech recognition technology has come along so far in the last few years. So I've generated some better subtitles using another service and I've superimposed it on the top. I've also superimposed some descriptive titles on the top just to help you folks follow along at home. So anyway, without any further ado, I give you Ellie Pavlik and Raphael Pellier. Enjoy. Hi, Ellie. I know, Raphael. Hey, how's it going? I guess you, you talked to Tim before, so maybe you have a kind of more of a context of the previous conversation that started this one. So you, I'll let you decide where we're beginning, what the first topic is. Yeah, so we had a chat uh, back a few, a few weeks ago. So but you know, half of the uh, when I came on the podcast and we had to cut it short and we thought maybe, if, you know, if I come back on, we should do it as a, as a discussion and thank you for to uh, chat with you. So Tim thought that maybe some of the topics we could discuss would be compositionality and grounding since we're both very interested in that. Seems um, natural. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I don't know whether we should, we should try to, to disagree more than we actually do, because I think we, we're aligned on a yeah. lot of these topics, but uh, you know, I'm sure there are some yeah, topics. But I, that, yeah. Right. I mean, I also feel like for both of them, I'm like, I know what I currently think, but I also am pretty prepared to just have to renege in a couple of years and be like, I was wrong. So I feel like I, we, we can see both sides. So we can definitely simulate some disagreement or we can... We don't have to disagree, but we could argue both sides of whichever issue. Um, I don't know. Wh where do you want to start? Do you want to talk grounding or do you want to talk compositionality? I think I have more uh, immediate questions with respect to compositionality. So one thing I was wondering is how yeah. do you see um, the progress on compositional generalization benchmarks? So just, you know, for the, for the listener of yours, um, what, it, it's really hard to assess whether large language models turn on, on language, uh, on, on huge corpora, actually acquire the capacity to, to generalize compositionally properly because you can never really know what's in the training data with these models like before. You can really know, never really know whether they're, they're, they're memorized structures and so on. So what strategies to use synthetic data sets um, uh, that's, uh, such that you, know, you, you train them on a test set and, and uh, on a train set, and then when you test them, the only way that they can achieve a good score is by generalizing perf perfectly. Um, and so there has been some, the, the initial results from some of these uh, data sets and benchmarks like uh, SCAN, COGS, and, and others were a little bit mixed with LSTMs and transformers. And lately there have been a lot of uh, steady improvements, partly due to tweaks in the architecture. And I remember having this discussion with, with Tal uh, Linsen when I organized this uh, competition at the workshop that was speaking at. Um, and one of the 
one of the contentious points is whether we could call these tweaks or whether these are significant changes. And that's always the, the crux of the debate, I think, including also with things like uh, Paul Smolensky, uh, Paul Smolensky's approach that uh, has you know, explicit tensor product representations is how much of a how much of a, mm -hmm. a hand engineered tweak you make in the architecture uh, to solve this compositional generalization problem mm -hmm. and and how much do we need? So I was just wondering where you where you stand on that. Hmm. That's a super interesting. I mean, so yeah. So on the compositional generalization test, I mean, I probably have like an unsatisfying middle ground opinion. I'm curious what your thoughts are. So I think I think we're both pretty interested in the kind of mechanistic stuff right now. So I guess for the audience, this is um, this idea that. Uh, like this idea of trying to kind of understand what the models are doing um, kind of under the hood. So when we think about the, I guess, compositional generalization tasks, it's like we have some inputs. What are the training, like what is the training the model gets? And then what are the outputs that it produces? Um, and that's really the data that we're basing our claim about whether it's compositional or not on. Um, and the kind of mechanistic or the other approaches to try to um, like characterize what actually is the process it used to get from the inputs to the outputs. Um, I really like uh, Chris Ola, who I think coined the term mechanistic, uses the phrase of kind of trying to understand the source code of the model. So it's like you have, um, you want that kind of something, like a kind of human understandable description of the algorithm that it's running under the hood. Um, and so, like, I've just, I've been super hung up on that. Like, I think all of my, my projects, all of like what my students are working on are some flavor of that because to me, I think that the reason it's so, I think it's interesting, but it also just feels like the the questions about things like compositionality are almost um, stuck right now without that level of description. So if we're just looking at what are the inputs and what are the outputs, I just feel like we're, it's just going around in circles with people like, like we're not really making progress on the issue. There's kind of people who are inclined to agree and inclined to disagree. Um, and so from my perspective, like, okay, so if we have the model that's doing this kind of, I guess, quasi generalization, it's like succeeding on some cases, it's not perfectly um, compositionally generalizing in the kind of really abstract case that those data sets tend to be going for. Um, but it's doing something in between. And we're trying to figure out whether that counts as um, compositional or not. It seems like that just hinges on what it's actually doing under the hood and how it's doing it. Um, so I guess I'm like, I'm like, basically like, <laughs> like neutral on or not paying attention to compositional generalization data sets right now. And I recognize like a very fair criticism. And I feel like when I've talked to people like Tal probably have this where it's like, you can't just sidestep the issue. It feels like being overly generous to the neural networks, right? It's like, they're not doing that well. And then you like change the game a little bit, right? You're like, oh, well, that's not even the metric we care about. Now, that's not really what I would see as the goal. It's just like in the immediate term, it seems like first we want to characterize what's happening under the hood. And then we can come back to those data sets and understand them much more in depth. And then when we see how they're solving it or not solving it, we can like it gives us a much more concrete thing to analyze and try to ask whether that counts as compositional or whether that's at all human like if that's what we care about. Um, like it, like I guess to me, it feels like a dead end if we're not allowed to comment on the procedure that happened in between. And right now we can't comment on the procedure that happened in between inputs and outputs because we just don't know what's happening there. So I don't know, I guess that's my current take on compositional generalization data sets is I'm like, now is not the right time for them. We'll come back to them later, um, which I recognize seems like a dodge, but it's not meant as a dodge. It's like, basically, we'll come back to this later. Um, yeah, but I'm curious what you, what you think about them. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to to that view. I and mean, as you know, I'm super interested in the mechanistic representability, which is to, to, to looking at propositionality. And I guess in the background, there is lurks this, this debate about uh, whether humans themselves have something like a, a perfectly compositional language of thought or, right. or something else, right? Um, Absolutely. And, um, and so perhaps, you know, we might, we might learn some things about, uh, computations, uh, implementing in human cognition by looking at these imperfect, uh, computational systems. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that would be really my, because like, so right now, and this is a gross oversimplification of where the two viewpoints are, but like the two really concrete, like, uh, um, 
kind of options on the table for like what a system can be is like this pure symbolic language of thought and that the language of thought it would be something like humans in their heads have something like a python program language like a perfect kind of formal system for reasoning over symbols in this compositional way or it's like this um loose or like these um, associations these idiomatic kind of just things mapped together and like i think most people would assume we're something in between and there's not a really good proposal for what the in between is right like there's all kinds of ways of being in between those two things and so i feel like whatever we find in the neural networks gives us some kind of concrete proposal like here's an example of an in between it's not the language of thought thing they're also obviously not just giant lookup tables right they're doing something more than that and so whatever they're doing in between it's at least like a candidate for what could be happening, right? That's pretty exciting. And it might not be the right one, but at least it's something because I haven't seen like a really satisfying candidate for what the in-between is, right? Like a lot of the debate still seems to kind of put these two straw men up against each other. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think some, even some of the people who are pushing back against this kind of uh, purely symbolic thing with their thoughts, architecture, like Paul Smolensky, they still think that you need to build into your connections model some more explicit uh, compositional structure with these uh, right. terms of product, but these, these vectors, like rod and filler vectors that are narrow terminal and that you can combine with tensor product operations. And there are other uh, vector symbolic architectures like this that do it like that. And uh, my qualm is always with, with this, and I have to thought about this. And uh, I think, you know, he's open to the possibility that perhaps transformers you know, handling compositionality in the way transformers handle it might turn out to be enough, perhaps. But my qualm is that if you if you build, you know, if you, if you kind of hard code into your uh, network architecture or, or you do some feature engineering to have the, the uh, input vectors be near or terminal, that seems just to be ad hoc to me, right? So you need to specify mm -hmm. what are the roles, what are the fillers. And that's yeah. that seems like an, an implausible model for how cognition works, unless you want to say that there are inex atomic concepts and we just do our body. I mean, a lot of people do, yeah. right? That That's like a, a claim that I think a large fraction of cognitive science is very happy to say is the case, is that there's an inventory of innate atomic concepts, right? right? Um, yeah. right. But, but yes, I agree. I think maybe it's the computer scientist gut or something. Something about that is unsatisfying, or at least you want a story of where those came from which still seems like you somehow it needs to emerge or come from data or come from some kind of pressure other than just we got lucky and they were there by chance, right. the right inventory of concepts. I mean, there's some daylight between the core knowledge view that, you know, there are some some basic you know, concepts and, and the photo-orient view that all atomic concepts must be in it because uh, right. yes. <laughs> we're just born with yeah, this repertoire yeah, yeah. yeah. of atomic concepts yeah. and they're unlearnable. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And it seems that if you, if you want to handle all compositionality with these ad hoc world and filler vectors or something along these lines, then you, it seems like you're going in that direction. Um, and what I'm excited about with transformers is that it looks like they can do something that in my mind, if you look at mechanistic interpretability literature, looks quite like variable binding. Uh, mm -hmm. by reading and writing information to subspaces of the main embedding space and using that as a virtual mm -hmm. content addressable memory. But it's fuzzy, right? It's not just implementing mm -hmm. a classical symbolic architecture, because that's always the charge that I think the, the, the classicists are, are, are you know, mm -hmm. leveraging against uh, the connectionists is that, oh, if, you're, if your model is working well and if it's, if it's uh, a good model of human behavior, then uh, presumably it's just implementing classical symbolic architecture. And it's... Right. Right, 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 right. I mean, almost, I, we're, I'm i uh, teaching a class this spring on language processing in humans and machines, and we were talking about this question of um, implementing a classical architecture. And it's actually quite uh, hard to tell, even in the historic debates on this, like what what people are even claiming about this, right? Like there's like simultaneously claims that like, oh, it'll... Like, sure, it can implement it, but also nothing it ever does would ever count as an implementation. Like, I just can't even tell what the what actually the consensus is. But I agree. I think we'll get something that ha uh, the ideal is that when we look into the Transformers, we'll find something that preserves the really necessary pieces of it, um, but is different enough to be interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess 
it, in some ways, if what we did, if what we ended up finding was something that was identical to the classical architecture, that would be like, I think a huge win for classical architecture people, right? That the only way these transformers a were able to solve it was by learning to implement the thing they said that you would need all along. But I think it's unlikely that we would find that, right? Like, I don't really know exactly how that would even work. Um, so we'll get something like this fuzzy version, um, which, which I think would just be fascinating. I mean, I'm curious. So the variable binding stuff. So I'm, I'm generally take the position that the transformers, these other large neural networks will be able to implement like these core kind of symbolic operations. We'll be able to replicate this kind of behavior. Um, and that when we kind of dig under the hood, we'll be able to find these clever implementations of these things. Um, but variable binding is one of these things where I've actually really struggled to find good evidence of it. Um, uh, the, and, and I guess particularly, so in language models, it almost su seems like you have to say it's there by, like, by fiat because of some of these, um, the ability of the models to do this compositional generalization stuff. Like they, they, uh, I think Tom McCoy had a really cool paper where it was showing that they could generate some like syntactic structures that were unattested in training. So for something like that, you're like, well, I guess to do that, you would have to have something like a abstract filler and role binding. Um, but especially when we've played around the, the language and vision models, and maybe it's just that clip yeah. kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess clip is the one of the pre-trained image and text models that kind of is trained to map um, uh, images to to text captions, but we've had several projects of trying to show, I guess, clip and then the image generation models based on top of it, like mm -hmm. um, Dolly and yeah. things like that. Um, like we just can't get any evidence that it's doing anything clever or abstracting away from the um, from the structure. So that's where we'll look for stuff like a red cube in front of a blue cube, and then blue cube in front of a red cube, or things like the I guess the famous on Twitter like. Um, uh, astronaut so riding true. a horse, a horse riding an astronaut. Um, and like, w even with really controlled cases and doing it in large data, so, like we just can't get it to do anything that gives us any data to point to, to be like, look, it's doing okay. Um, but maybe it's just a clip problem. Maybe I, clip just sucks. I think it's, I, I think it's a clip problem. So that's, that's, I wanted to talk about this because you have this really interesting paper about it. And, um, I think we can't generalize any finding about vision language models based on constructive learning like clip to say language yeah. models trained autoregressively. Uh, there is this recent paper from Stanford, um, I can't figure out the first author is mm. like, which, which confirms my suspicions. Basically the idea is that click treats ends up treating text, like just bag of, bags of words, because mm -hmm. in order to, to, to fulfill the contrastive learning objectives of bringing together uh, the captions and images that go together and further away in the space, the ones that don't go together, you don't need to actually induce much about syntax, right? Just Which keywords yeah. is, is sufficient. Yeah. And, and generally also in the captions themselves, you don't have a ton of information about say like the, the relative positioning of different objects or how many of, you know, it's not like you say there are key forks and one and one knife or you just say a mm -hmm. plate with mm -hmm. forks and knives or something in the caption. Right. Right. Um, right. And if you look at all the models, like party from Google, all the image generation models that yeah. use a pre-trained, as a text encoder, they use a pre-trained language model, but yeah. they actually do way better at things like, Much you better. Know, uh, yeah. 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 And I, I think that surprised me in trying to do, so we did the red cube, blue cube, um, kind of stuff. Cause that's like super abstract and it's easy to do. But one of my other students, Charlie Lovering is working on a project with some of the image generation models to do, to try to kind of more systematically look at the, you know, horse riding an astronaut kind of example. And one thing that struck me with it is just how, um, like how, uh, not uniformly distributed the world is, right? Like, it's just like finding examples of relations, like where you want to have like argument one relation mm -hmm. argument two, yeah. that can actually exist in both directions. And like, right. that's a thing that a human could visualize. We like, it's really, really hard to do. Like we're restricted to a really simple set of relations because we like spit out a whole ton of things and tried flipping the order. And you're like, yeah, this isn't a thing I could actually um, imagine or would expect a human to be able to to um, realize in any kind of way. And so it, that I think getting at kind of 
revisiting our assumptions about how compositional humans are, I think that's like kind of mm. relevant data to have is like, how often are we actually forced right. to combine completely novel elements in a purely abstract way without anything that we can relate it to? Like what we think we're our kind of working theory for what the model is doing for these kinds of things is like, if you ask for a horse riding an astronaut, it's like finding the most similar thing it's seen. Um, right. It's like, well, here's an example of like a, you know, a teddy bear riding a, a puppy dog or something and then morphs it into a horse riding, like some other type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not actually an absurd model to assume might be underlying some kind of compositional behavior in humans too. Right? Yeah. It reminds me of the, this, it might be with respect to language models that finds all these content effects on reasoning where, you know, mm -hmm. when you test about syllogisms or the, 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 the Western selection tasks, you, you get, uh, you get these effects that are similar you know, also found in humans, where if you fill in the story or the task with plausible details that uh, could apply to real life, then they do much better. Right. And if you right. just use right. this like far fetched, you know, abstract examples. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's been shown, like, I know this is, um, I don't remember the authors, but there's a pretty classic study about the kind of logical syllogisms, right? Like, if you ask people to reason about these, just like, you know, famous modus ponens mm -hmm. or whatever, when you ask them like A, not A, like people suck, yeah. they don't know yeah. how to do it. But if you put it in realistic, real world scenario, like you're at a party, you can have uh, ice cream and cake or whatever, then people do totally fine. Yeah. And I think it, um, it wouldn't be surprising that we might have these, uh, that we would have evolved to be able to reason about realistic scenes and not abstract ones. Yeah, and and the the I think this the skill to be able to 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 reason over the most the more abstract examples or including with with images combined in those objects in plausible ways is something probably we require through training and people of, you know who have taught children math for example are probably familiar with that so you kind of need to do some prompt engineering as it were to to get them to actually <laughs> you know grasp certain concepts or right. or to. Uh, you know, teaching logic, even to, to undergrads, uh, um, yeah. you, you get a lot of resistance from this complex effects and you need to really prime the right. intuitions in the right way. And I, I would, I wonder whether, you know, with the astronauts, uh, running a horse for example, whether it would be interesting to try that with, with small children and see whether, yeah. you know, whether they actually do well at, at that task. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would have to assume they would, right? So that's where, like, my intuitions are strongly, like, but humans are quite compositional. Mm -hmm. Like, you would you would have to assume that they would know how to, um, they wouldn't just draw a horse riding, or if you asked for a horse riding astronaut, yeah. they wouldn't just draw an astronaut riding a horse, yeah. right? Um, they might, like, giggle and be like, that's silly, <laughs> like, horses don't ride at something, right? But, um yeah, I mean, I guess, so I guess some counterexamples to both of our intuitions. So that there's some of this variable binding stuff, but with the image models, and I'm kind of like, I'm willing to um, give the models a pass, at least in the immediate term while we figure out what's going on, because I'm like, yeah, I think some of this um, perfectly abstract compositionality might be like a tall order and not something we would have to do. But the other thing that's always been weird to me, so like, I'm channeling Roman Feynman, my uh, colleague here, who's like much more language of thought tradition. Um, and, you know, he'll, he'll say uh, that, you know, of, of course, humans are like, you know, better at like he's aware of all the data that people aren't as good at logical reasoning in some settings, but they can do this other sentence and things like that. But it's like that doesn't undermine that humans have logical capacities like we use negation freely all the time. Like we don't really struggle with that. Um but the language models actually still kind of suck at negation. Um, like it's pretty easy to just write something uh, in a slightly odd way and get them to ignore that you negated something. I think even fairly recently, I guess I haven't tried this in the past month, so maybe it's fixed. But like I asked something like ask GPT or chat GPT, I think, for like a recipe that like uses tofu and nutritional yeast but isn't vegetarian or something like that. And it just spits out some vegetarian recipes or something or you'd be like you know use sugar and lemon but not a dessert and it's like have you tried lemon bars and stuff so it's like it just kind of ignores it um and that's weird to me because yeah. that seems like for a language model doing a language modeling task like that's relevant like that's not this isn't like a super trick out of distribution thing um so that's kind of like i guess a 
a thorn that like I feel like that's where I say like I have a bit of a caveat where I ex- I wouldn't be surprised if a couple years from now I have to be like yeah I was wrong the models are not at all like human like or something I'm hoping that's not the case but these kind of data points are like yeah that's it's frustrating how bad they are with negation um, or other kind of basic things like that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always a moving target, of course, because people, you know, maybe chat G, or GP4 can, can handle that particular example, but I agree it's, it's definitely very unsatisfactory to, to still these, these failures and some, some composition yeah. of single problems. Yeah, like we have some, I guess, so, so on one of these projects with Roman in this undergrad, we're working with Alyssa, um, we... And this is just super frustrating data for me. Although actually it is getting better with the bigger models. So maybe it is one of these things. But for GPT-3, um, it was like, we have this very basic task that uh, they had run on humans. So you say something like, um, it like gives some little scenario. And then you say, uh, you know, the it's like some scenario about scientists running experiments on rats. And it's like the scientists saw that um, none of the rats liked the food or something. And then it's like, now that they knew that some of the rats liked the food and they like did human reading time and saw that people showed a slowdown and were surprised by the word some in that case because um, it's a blatant contradiction to what was just said. Um, and when we use like GPT-3 and predict surprisal, there's like no surprisal whatsoever, no suggestion of any of being at all bothered by the word some in that context, which is weird because that's just a straight up language modeling task. It's just mm-hmm. what is the probability of this word in context, which the human data was very clearly like it's low and the, um, and the model was like, it's fine. And then, but then we had, we tried with GPT four and then the numbers, it looked better, but it was kind of messy because we can't get perplexities out of GPT four. Mm-hmm. So you had to ask it to fill in the blank it was a little bit different, so it's like hard to read into. Yeah, it was just the ChatGPT version, or um, the with GPT three we had the API. Because now GPT four is um, available by the API as well. See right yeah, here. but it doesn't. We need to check. Okay. Yeah, we need to check. Last we checked, we couldn't get perplexities okay. out. Okay. All right. Like we had the API, but you. Ah, yeah. I see. I haven't tried. The um, API. Okay. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's That's it's one of these weird things. Yeah. Yeah, and so so like maybe GPT four is better, but it wasn't as clean of a s- comparison to the humans, and um, and it was even for a model like GPT three, like it was surprising that it was so bad at that, and like I don't know, so I feel like there's a few of these data points that are like uh, this story isn't a slam dunk, mm-hmm. like there's some of these things that really should be easy for a model with basic structure, um, you know. Yeah, it's surprising to me because there are you know these studies from Tal and others showing that even way smaller models. Um, can exhibit the, 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 the right behavior in terms of surprisal when you look at things like subject verb agreement or fetal gap dependencies, you know, and other constraints on these and, you know, mm-hmm. a wide range of syntactic right. phenomena and they exhibit the right. same patterns as humans in terms of being surprised when the, right. the verb doesn't agree right. with the subject and things like that, right? Even totally, when you yeah. throw in our structures or the structures to, to confuse it. Right. Um, so why is negation? Right, such totally. A, so. Totally. It seems much, much simpler, right? Like it's not like, it, it, if anything, I feel like negation plus these quantifier terms, like you could just enumerate a table and say these things can go together and can't go together. Like, it, I mean, there's like a little more semantic cushion around it. You have to know who the, who's being modified or whatever, but like, I'm quite sure models can do all of that. So I was very surprised. It might be just that it's a really infrequent thing in the training data, in the input. But then you have this poverty of the stimulus argument that you have to account for, right? Is like, um, I mean, maybe yeah. it is that this kind of entailment relation is just not frequent on the internet, but it is in kids' input or, I, I, you know, I don't know. Or maybe it is that the models are just not the right models for this task. I don't want to believe that, though. I think yeah. there must be some other reason. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there was this paper by Will Merrill that shows that uh, entailment mm-hmm. semantics can be yep. induced by an, an idealized, yeah. you know, an ideal language model uh, yeah. on synthetic data uh, up to a certain sentence length uh, in, in, con- right. in, 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 real, in in real world uh, scenarios. There's only, given the size of right. GPT-3, I think perfect entanglement semantics could only be induced, according to this formal proof, up to sentences of four words. Um, 
<laughs> but but if you want perfect, absolutely, yeah. you know, perfect. Right, right, right. You yeah. exactly know whether yeah. one sentence and the next can tell each other. Or right. Which I don't know that I believe in entailment. As a thing, right? right. Like yeah. I just like there's it's like the logic stuff. You're like, OK, we can come up with these like toy domains in which we all agree about entailment. But like during my PhD, I did a lot of work on entailment and just trying to collect entailment judgments on humans right. is a nightmare. Right. right. Like they do not behave to the point that you have. Like, yeah. that's what I feel like that was like a switching point for me where I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I should accept that they, that we have to trust them on yeah, what yeah. is entailed or not. And they assume yeah. idealized Gracian speakers as well, which you know, humans right. are not. Yeah. yeah. No, not. But it's, it's, yeah. it's intriguing because it does suggest that, I mean, you can learn something about the term and semantics from distributional information, yeah. uh, even, you know, in terms of, you know, lose a sense, like in the non-perfect right. sense. Right. So again, why is negation so hard is, is, uh, is yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I haven't seen a really good study on just the distribution of negation in the, like in a model's training corpus, like how is it used in what context? Cause I don't, um, yeah, like I, it might just be that it's actually, it's just not distributed the way we kind of think it's distributed. It just functions very differently in written text in general. Um, yeah. Right? Like I do think that perhaps kids would learn it, like kids get a very different input of negation than what I would imagine is on the internet. Right. right. Like I, in academic writing, I use negation only in the most convoluted ways. Like, like it with like these triple negations <laughs> yeah. that are right. You know, like while it is not unreasonable <laughs> yeah. to assume that such is not the case, right? Like yeah. that's the way I would use negation. Yeah. I wouldn't say like, that's not a dog. <laughs> yeah. Like no one writes that. Um, yeah. And also it's, it's interesting because in, in, in terms of the, the, the text that's actually generated right, language models, I don't think, you know, even with GPT-3 in my experience, you see negation errors. I, I can't even remember right. you know, when, when they actually right, generate text, they use negation properly. It's more right. when the parsing yeah. prompt somehow, sometimes they ignore the negation as if they're trying to maximize the relevance of every word. Uh, so if you right. mention, if you say, I want you to give me recipes, but not include paprika, they see the word paprika yeah. in there and it's like, I need to right. maximize the, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the relevance of but Right. Yeah. And it might be, I, so when I was playing around with the recipes and stuff, it did seem to change a lot. I mean, it was anecdotal, but um, on the wording. So like, if you marked it a lot more, right, like, um, like if you said something like a recipe with these things, but include meat, it does fine. Right. So if you say not vegetarian, it gets confused. Also, if you'd say like, and not vegetarian versus, but not vegetarian and like where you put like, um, like where you whether you front loaded or back loaded mm. certain information, it made a difference. And so you could imagine there's these distributional signals where it's like when people are saying, don't do this thing, they mark it in a few ways, right? They don't just like slip in the negation, but otherwise have the sentence read exactly like it would in the positive case. Um, like there's probably a reason we have but as a conjunction and not and, right? It's just to like help emphasize so that people don't miss that negation piece of it. Right. Um, so like you could imagine something like that, that it's like the model has very little incentive to emphasize the negation unless there's a, other signals that you really are right yeah so you wouldn't like be deathly allergic to paprika and then just like slip it in mm -hmm. give me a recipe for chicken paprika without paprika or something yeah. and then yeah. just like you know yeah no the, uh so, so so one other thing with this like was right to you about and viable binding that i wanted to, to ask you about there, there's this uh preprint that uh i don't think ever got published on, uh, on archives that's alleges that, uh, you know, they looked at, at variable binding in transformers and I can't mm -hmm. exactly remember the method, but, uh, they alleged that, um, they found that transformers can't mm -hmm. really do variable binding unless it's by using the output as, as an external memory. And that relates to some of the discussion that we had at the conference, mm -hmm. uh, that I co-organized with, uh, Dave Chinese and Netflix, few weeks ago, with the mm -hmm. Gat, where, um, Nick Shea made a somewhat similar claim that, you know, the kinds of what he calls non-content specific reasoning that transformers can uh -huh. do, yeah. or language models can do, um, is always propped up by reasoning on the output. So using, using the generated mm -hmm. word, let's say in Shen, Shen, Shen mm -hmm. prompting, you just reason step by step mm -hmm. and use, use the, the steps in the generated steps as a crutch, uh, 
to solve problems. And maybe that really is also this paper, this paper you've, you've written structural mm. compositionality mm. and subroutines. I remember. Um, yeah. I haven't yet had a chance to read that one, but, but, uh, I just wanted to ask you because I, what was striking to mm. me that you, you can do some things, zero shot with current language models that seem to fly in the, in the face of that kind of thing. So for example, with GP4, uh, you can, you can tell it's behaves like a Python shell, uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then define a function with a bunch of variables and then a little bit later in the, in the interaction, just, you know, call that function for specific values yeah. and, and say, you know, and because it's behaving like a Python shell, it just has to give the answer with zero shot. It's not able to do some yeah. chain of thought or whatever. It just has to right. give it. And it can do this pretty reliably when right. there are some failure modes, but the fact that it can do it at all suggests to me that it can, it has to be able to internally, uh, right. you know, manipulate the other variables. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I love that example that you gave in the workshop. Um, so at this philosophy of deep learning workshop, because you had that, like you had it behave like a Python shell and do this Fibonacci sequence. Prediction. Yeah. So I told but us then we two just functions. Ask the language model, like we can just ask the language model to predict or to tell you the, you know, 700th mm -hmm. Fibonacci number, it messed it up. Right. Yeah. So that was did, like yeah. super interesting. And yeah, I guess the thing we like fight with, with these models is that they're, you know, they're. Like we do know that they have, that they've trained over the whole internet. And so they've learned to like kind of subspaces, right? And they're like drawing from these different domains and it's makes it really hard to interact with them because they can always, um, anthropomorphizing, but they can always pull this like, oh, sorry, I didn't understand the question yeah. game, right? Like I thought I was being my Reddit self, but it turns out you wanted me to be my New York Times self or something like, and it could always pull that. So it could be like, oh yeah, no, I know how. But you have to ask me to ask, act yeah. like a Python shell because people on the internet don't know the Fibonacci number, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. and this is a little bit of like, for the for the critics of large language models, this is a frustrating game to play because, like, like this is always a move that the proponents of language models can make is like, oh, you didn't ask it right, like it knows how, but it blah blah blah, um, which is really why I feel like the mechanistic stuff is so important because if we know more about it, then this becomes like less of, it feels less like you're sidestepping the criticisms and we can just say what actually happened. But I do think um, that right now that is the case, right? Like it could be that they have the ability to bind variables and do this stuff, but just they uh, have deemed that that's not the right way to solve the task in the average case or in a typical case. Like maybe negation yeah. is not important for the typical thing, but if it, if they're acting as a Python shell, then of course negation is important, right? Yeah, and, I, and I'm really interested in the role of, of RLHF fine tuning in that context, so reference both learning function yeah. and feedback, because it, look, it looks like it's it's vastly improving the zero shot capacities of the model. And I think there's some of evidence that it ends up, you know, uh, condensing the probability mass of, uh, you know, the distribution of uh, over over the next word for to, to a much more narrow range uh such that you know of just a few words will have a high probability for certain for certain prompts because it's it's essentially enabling the model to to latch onto the right uh task right, right away right. right instead of having to do this i mean still as right. you said it still happens all the time oh sorry right. i didn't uh, yeah, get yeah. your question right but if you ask a question zero shot to vanilla gpt3 without the hf uh, it will way more often just have no clue what you're really asking it and you have to right. like massage oh, yeah, yeah. the prompt and totally yeah, yeah 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 i like to use i like that um uh open ai recently re-released their like the old school uh gpt3 because you can see what a big difference even the instruction tuning makes like right. um my favorite is if you ask something like write a report on uh the war in ukraine or something um it'll like follow it up as though it's like in an email and it'll be like please include additional like details on budgets and blah, blah, blah. Please get it to me by Monday regards or something like rather than writing a report, it like gives you a list of other tasks to do. Um, but yeah, so there's clearly like, like the RLHF clearly improves zero shot or at least in, even instruction tuning. Something I'm, I don't know, maybe you've thought about this more. I know we talked about this like briefly before, like just, I guess I'm, I'm still getting my head around what RLHF is or in particular, how it's like, if it is profoundly different from other types of training, because I feel like in some cases, like I've heard a lot of people kind of crediting RLHF as like possibly like, oh, we have all these problems, 
with um, with large language models, but maybe RLHF alleviates them. And I can never tell if there's like a genuine feeling that it does or if it's kind of a, this is a new kid on the block and we're not sure. So to kind of hedge or future proof whatever claims we're making, we add this caveat that's like maybe RLHF uh, alleviates it. Um, or maybe it's that like RL, in general, RL is associated with like grounded and maybe more cognitively plausible learning in certain domains. And so people right. hear the RL part and think that it's somehow better. But I ha I'm not quite sure if RL is like, RLHF is like deeply different or if you could induce the exact same behavior through something more like an instruction tuning setup. Um, like I genuinely don't know which of those things is going on and I haven't heard... Uh, like, I know there are people trying to come up with a fine-tuning variant that otherwise behaves the same as RL, B, RLHF because yeah. RLHF is unstable and people don't like it. When I, Brown has a lot of people who work on RL and they look at RLHF and they're like, this isn't even really RL um, because it's weird and it just seems like you've kind of like folded more language models on top of each other. Um, so, so, yeah, I just, I don't know how I feel about it. And my gut is to be like, no, it's not special. It's like, the same stuff in a new package, um, but that's based on absolutely nothing except vibes. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I do share that intuition with respect to the difference between RLHF and instruction tuning, because it seems, you know, if you look at uh, what people did with the Lama model from Metal AI, there's just generated yeah. a bunch of, of you know, input output pairs with GPT-4 or something mm -hmm. to create the, uh, what is it, mm -hmm. Vicuña or um, Alpaca? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the, the, of these camelid animals. <laughs> uh, so they, they, yeah, so they generated essentially the instruction tuning uh, train set uh, from models that had benefited from RLHF, and then you kind of get the benefits of RLHF right. for free uh, right. uh, or for a few hundred dollars. And, right. uh, and so it seems that actually this works pretty well, right? So, right. so maybe, I don't know. I, I don't... mean, it could be... I'm, I'm just pure speculation, but like it, that could be the case and RLHF is special. It could be that RLHF allows you to optimize for a function that you can't directly optimize for with next word prediction. But if you have an RLHF trained model, you can then distill that function like the neural yeah, yeah. can then directly yeah. something like that. Uh, but, but I'm but almost like, like yeah. I, I want to say that RLHF doesn't even optimize for a different or special or function that like you could just take the data you get from RLHF and just use it differently and like fine tune on it or something. Um, I mean, that must not be the case. So like I said, I'm like purely speculating, but that I think yeah. that's the intuition that I'm just like deeply wanting right now is like, is there something special going on? Um, or is it just, we found a different way of getting somewhere. Um, like we kind of stumbled upon it and we could actually get the same effect and and it's, I feel like it matters. It matters from an engineering standpoint, but it also matters because I just hear RLHF. Actually, I would like to talk to you about that because you like mentioned it in your grounding paper. Or like, and I've heard it in a, from a lot of people. Um, like uh, Ev Fedorenko uh, had a paper on kind of disassociating language and thought and had all these yeah. different criticisms of large language models and the things they can't do. And then at the end, it's like, but maybe RLHF solves all of this. And I was like, whoa, that's like a huge, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah. And so, and I, and I've seen similar things elsewhere. And so I think to me, I'm like, I'm just deeply curious if that's the case. Like, I, I think I'm lacking that intuition. Though. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's first of all, that's the transition to the topic. Yeah, exactly. Me, so <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, so just to, to for, for, the, for the audience, uh, the, so with, with the machine color model, we wrote this paper and essentially we said, well, people use the notion of grounding in different ways in the literature. Uh, a lot of this goes back to Harnock's simple grounding problem from the 1990, um, uh, 90 and uh, in which he argues that symbolic, uh, AI models lack the capacity to have intrinsically meaningful representations and outputs, um, because, you know, the, the, the semantic interpretation of, of their representations is provided externally by the programmers. So CHRDLU, for example, it's a old school program that could manipulate blocks in the blocks world. Uh, it, it can link, it can connect its linguistic representations to virtual objects, but that connection is provided you know, ad hoc and externally by extrinsically by the programmers. Um, and the problem is how do we get models that actually intrinsically grounded uh, representations of legacy guidance where 
uh, here the key notion of burning is referential. So how do we get representations that are ref actually making reference to the, the objects out there in the world that they are bound? And that problem has really emerged with recent uh, connections models with various worlds and so on. And, and you've done a lot of really fantastic work on that. And so we, we were trying to um, pick apart different notions of grounding, say the referential notion of grounding is the most important one, and, and then say, well, in light of that, can we say that language models training text only achieve some form of ref referential grounding? And we do mention our LHF because we've, basically the argument is, is going from the perhaps the most plausible and convincing argument for the most people to something that's a bit more speculative. So with our LHF, um, so the problem essentially is that with, with next word prediction, that's, a, that's an intralinguistic function, right? So you're predicting the next word, that's how it is more pre-trained. Um, and that doesn't seem to give you quite the, the at least intuitively, the right kind of, of uh, normativity for, for representations of, of the worldly reference of linguistic items. Uh, such that you could have the possibility of misrepresenting something. Um, so in other words, you don't have, it doesn't have to give you the right kind of world involving function. It's just, you know, whether you're right or wrong about the next token. Um, and our like chef, on the other hand, because you get this explicit feedback from humans, including feedback about uh, truthfulness, or honesty, you know, the three H's of our chef is helpfulness, harmlessness, and honesty, right? So, there's at least one of these, which is a normative component that's about, that's an epistemic normative component. It's about whether you're, if you're, you know, answering questions about capitals of the world, uh, whether you're right or wrong about the state of the world when you say that Paris is the capital of France. Uh, so that seems to be world involving in the right way. But then, you know, I, we had this conversation uh, a few weeks back, and, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, it seems that, you know, you could get that the right kind of world involving function without this explicit feedback from humans. And we do actually think that that's the case. So um, and going there from a slightly less consensual uh, claim, we think that you can get in context learning and in context learning, you have a fusion. When you have a fusion prompt, where you have several examples of successful computer of a task. If it's a fusion prompt on worldly facts, you also get this implicit uh, feedback in the prompt about what's right or wrong in the world. And if, you, if you're seeing context learning as uh, you know, inducing a function, uh, uh, optimizing for a function that's not just next word prediction, uh, then you can also see that as providing a world evolving function. But then you can go even further and say, well, after all, why not look at pre-training? And after all, there are some context windows in there that will include discussions of worldly facts where in order to do the next word prediction, which is the proximate function, the model might have to induce a, 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 a more complicated uh, ultimate function that's about the real world. So. I think that's where your intuition is, yeah. is taking you, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think exactly. Like, and, and this is this. Yeah, I love, I mean, I love the paper and I like this idea of the world evolving function because I think that is the, um, that's kind of the intuition that we all have, right? Like there, there does seem to be something that's not, uh, like I think if mo most people's gut instinct is like next word prediction over text isn't enough, right? And then the challenge is figuring out like what, like where is the line, like what is the what it actually is the problem with it, right? And that's um, and that's where I'm kind of stuck because I think my like in my heart I kind of don't want language model next word prediction to count. Like I don't want that to be the whole thing. Um, and then I just like, and a lot of our own work though, we seem to be arguing the opposite. Like, I'm not quite sure where I fall on yeah. this issue. And so it's like, yeah, you want something like this, like this world of our function or something about the learning mechanism, right? The learning mechanism doesn't feel like enough. You're like, no, obviously people do more, right? Than predict the thing that happens next. But then like formalizing what that difference is, I just, I haven't been able to convince myself. Like, I haven't been able to come up with a thing that I'm like, yeah, that's the thing. I totally buy it. Like sometimes it gets on this issue of like goals. And I guess this actually came up a bit in the philosophy of deep learning debate. Like, you know, and when I talk to a lot of cognitive scientists and people who don't like the next word prediction language model, it's like, yep, yeah, you know, people have goals, but that feels like a weird, um, because you can say that the language model has a goal and the goal is to predict the next word. And like, so now are we just like making a, a, a judgment about, what goals count as good ones and not good ones. There's a similar, yeah, like this kind of, um, 
having the person give the feedback who is sufficiently tied to the world. And now it seems like we've like outsourced the question of whether the model is grounded to something about the trainer and the goals of the trainer, which maybe actually is fine. Maybe philosophically that's fine. You're like to follow along this causal chain, you have to have kind of inherited from somebody who's also on the causal chain. So I, I mean, I don't know. Cause like, yeah, if you had like somebody giving RLHF feedback who is like, um, in- intentionally misleading, right. Um, or, or just confused and misinformed, like any of these types of things. Like, I don't know how that, um, muddy is the analysis of whether the model is now world involved or grounded, right. referentially grounded. Yeah, totally agree on the last point. I think if uh, the whole argument hinges also on the on the assumption that the crowd workers uh, actually you know know how to to run the outputs or do it do it right to a large extent, um, right? And there's this, and I guess this is a classic philosophical qualm too, right? Like because we can, like humans could be totally wrong about stuff, right? So like like science progresses, right? So right now we might be saying like, oh the um, I, I forget what one of the classic examples, the, um, like a lot of things about like viruses and diseases, right? Like mm. we had theories about what these different diseases were back in the day. And then we learned stuff and it's like an entirely new thing now. Right. But you wouldn't say that the people historically had like an ungrounded, meaningless notion of that thing. Um, right. So we, so like you need to account for the fact that we could be teaching the model something that is ultimately wrong because we haven't learned that in fact, you know, that I don't, I don't know. I can't. Um, yeah. No, I mean, but, but the thing is, I can't think of a good example. <laughs> the thing is theories of representations of representation will account for the fact that, uh, you can misrepresent things, right? So just because you have a, a you know, a linguistic, uh, like lexical concept that is referentially grounded, it doesn't mean that this precludes the possibility of, of you know, something going wrong and right. misrepresenting. Right. So like yeah. thinking, yeah. And I guess this is kind of, it's like, so if the model thinks that the capital of France is Berlin quote thinks that, and it pr- produces that as output, um, I guess we need to differentiate between the case where it's just wrong and ungrounded in learning loose associations versus it was quote mistaken. Right. But like, the, yeah. like, cause I, I could not know the capital of a city and like that it's true that I don't have quite the right concept of that thing, but it's not the same as me being a parrot that's just spitting out. Exactly. Nonsense, right. And so I, I don't think we quite, quite right now, I don't know how we're drawing that line within the models yeah. of them just producing wrong stuff versus. Yeah. yeah I mean, certainly with, uh, I, I think perhaps with things like RLHF, you can draw that line potentially, but with pre-training, I mean, and I share your intuition that, you know, it seems, it seems, uh, you know, uh, we don't really want to draw the line at RLHF. It just, it just seems like the, the low hanging fruit yeah. because that's what's right. going to convince right, right, the most people. Right. But, uh, and that's already, you know, it's already right. a sufficiently controversial statement to say length, Language model language model trained on text only can achieve a fresh oh, yes. with a right chef, right? Totally. But then yeah. we, we would want to go further like you and, uh, but then it's tricky. So, so here is the interesting that I have, uh, I, I've been maybe overly impressed by these recent papers that look at in context learning and, and, and mm-hmm. show that it's, this one paper from Google and others that show the same thing, essentially that they, it, they're functionally equivalent to right. fine tuning with gradient descent, even right, though you're right. not actually adjusting yeah. the weights. And what's their tuning on? What what's what's the what's the doing gradient descent virtually on? Is not next word prediction. It's whatever function is implicitly specified by the future that that it tends mm-hmm. in the future prompt. Right. Um, and so that really is the thing that convinced me. Okay, so 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 you could get the world involving stuff from that. And if you get mm-hmm. if you can get it at inference time within context learning, then presumably you could also get it at pre training time. If you totally. say you have a, a window, a context window that's a bunch of capital right. questions, like what's the capital right. of France? Totally, yeah. You know, right. Yeah. You have some right. few shot like stuff in the training right. data that right. presumably would allow the model right. to, when it's not at the beginning, when it's totally random, but when it starts learning right. and reaching loss at some point, right. you know, you might, you might get that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this is where, 
Like, I agree with that. And I, yeah, I agree with kind of calling out RLHF as possibly the, a differentiating point because it's like an, it's a, a good thing to ground to as, or not ground to, to overloading the word ground. It's a good, like, uh, p- data point, right, to use. And then trying to peel away, like, what is the minimal thing? Like, what about RLHF gives it that? And, but like, that's exactly that logic you just laid out is what I, I think I accept right now or feel somewhat forced to accept, right, based on this, because you're like, yeah, that seems correct. Um, but then I have to go back to putting on the hat of somebody, somebody who does not believe these language models, because, and I, and I think it is important to point out that when we're talking about language models being grounded or having meaning, it's not the same as saying they are uh, conscious and intelligent, yeah. right? Like, but sometimes, but that's, that's this kind of elephant in the room where it's like, where are we going next? And so I think when people are looking at these language models and they don't want to acknowledge that they can be referentially grounded because that seems like a step along the way to claiming that they are like human level cognition in all of these other ways. Um, it's so deeply unsatisfying. It's like, wait, no, like you've missed the point. Like now we're saying that just having a few examples during pre-training of someone listing off countries who wrote that down in, you know, good faith, just listing the capitals of countries, that's enough. And now the language model counts, even though it's just doing next word prediction over there. Like that seems insane. Right. And so I kind of like, I feel like I just go between these two positions of being like, like right now, based on everything, I feel kind of forced to accept like no language models. I would say they're referentially grounded. I can't find a good case to make for why they're not. And at the same time, I'm like, do do we really want to say that? That seems bizarre, right? Like, I just, <laughs> something yeah, I seems like we, wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we get our, for, uh, our hand forced by this, the kind of all or nothing thinking that you see sometimes in these debates where it's like, uh, at, at the high level, it's like either the stochastic power swap or it's like human, like, uh, you know, AGI with, with mm-hmm. you know, in understanding consciousness and just whatever you want to build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's this huge, you know, uh, uh, space in between possibilities that we could explore right. where you look at different capacities in a case by case basis and say that right. this, but not that. And then within each capacity, the like grounding, it's also a spectrum, right? It's not like, you know, we right. don't want to say you get a few examples of, of question answers about capitals and then that's it. You're, you, you're, you have <laughs> human like referential grounding on everything. Right? You so, check that box. Now you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, so, so presumably, you know, you could say, well, you know, that, that gets you, you know, your foot on the ladder of professional grounding right. in a tiny, tiny, tiny domain. Yes. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and that's still, you know, theoretically interesting. Yeah. Um, right. That, that said, I mean, there's something that I think is really interesting from your work on, uh, you know, isomorphisms between say, you know, color terms and, and the color space and stuff you've been working on with grounding that maybe suggests that sometimes when you get a toehold on grounding in a specific domain, you mm-hmm. could leverage the isomorphism between language and the world to get a little right. bit more for free. Uh, right, but, right, yeah. right, right. You definitely could imagine that. And I guess this is the project that you and I have started working on together is the kind of what kind of power of anal- analogy reasoning do these models have? Because, yeah, you could imagine something like this, like with a toehold and really strong reasoning by analogy capability, you could get a lot out of that. But I, I also agree. I think there's just this big middle ground. Like, it's not like you could, like, learning that the uh, the meaning of the capital cities or something shouldn't be enough that now by reasoning by analogy, you can infer, like, everything, the whole world. Like, yeah. that That seems, I, I would, if somebody could spell out a mechanism Via which that would happen, sure, but I can't imagine what that would be. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And just, I was, um, I was going to make a complete uh, detour, but I remembered we didn't talk about the Chomsky stuff when we were talking about Chomsky. Oh, reality. yeah. So right. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, that yeah, I have some thoughts, but I would like to hear your big. thoughts on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just for context, uh, well, Chomsky obviously has has. Uh, uh, been uh, writing about statistical models of language learning for decades, but he recently went on the records saying, as you would expect, that he's totally skeptical that you can learn anything whatsoever from language models about human language acquisition or human cognition in general. Uh, and he co-wrote this op-ed uh, in New York Times, uh, making that claim, um, even though he told me he would have 
he, he signed on it, but he would have made the points a little bit differently uh, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it goes in different directions. I think, you know, I have some points as well, how he opened his in a lot of different directions. I think his point is, is more, his core point is simpler. It's just, um, you know, language models, uh, the, 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 he, he makes an analogy with, with a theory of physics that would say anything goes and, uh, mm -hmm. and he said that wouldn't be a good theory of physics. And he's, he's, he's very impressed by this particular paper that, uh, from Bowers colleagues, I think who, that, that, uh, looks at learning supposedly impossible languages and showing that perhaps language models can learn such mm -hmm. languages and think that, mm -hmm. that's, that's, then that's a total non for for yeah. the ultimate language question. Um, and then there's Tiplin uh, wrote this paper that's saying, you know, taking the completely opposite stance saying language models refuse the whole program, Chomsky and programming linguistics. Um, and I, I mean, I, so I, I stand in between <laughs> as, as often in these discussions, so that's the, mm -hmm. the running thread, but I, I think there are, there's always room for positions in between the two extremes. Yes. Uh, so I think there, are, there was this interesting, interesting discussion that, um, uh, Tal Linton and others were having on Twitter where there, there are two versions of the property of the stimulus arguments that is used to, to justify the claim that there is something like an innate universal grammar in humans. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong version that Chomsky himself did defend in the past, and that some people still defend, and even in very popular grammar, uh, like, you know, generative grammar textbooks, which is syntax is just unlearnable from data, period. Like no amount of data will, will get you to learn syntactic structure because, uh, having this kind of recursive, uh, infinitely productive system is not something you can learn from data. Interesting. Period. Right. So, so I think. There is a good argument, and Steve makes a good argument for that being somewhat refuted by language models. Right? I mean, this kind of right. insofar as they can, you know, there is a lot of work showing that they can induce syntactic structure, uh, whether it's it, uh, yeah. in, in, in this semantic phenomena, oh, whether it's it's the subject verb agreements, uh, filling yeah, up dependencies, yeah. uh, uh, we can even decode past trees from snatches of bird. I mean, so, um, so that's a strong version. But then there is the, the more, in my, my mind, more reasonable developmental version, which is, well, look, children can do these constraint generalizations on certain syntactic phenomena, like if they get dependencies from a few examples from this impoverished stimulus. Um, and it seems like this is hard to come for if they don't have, you know, strong in inductive bias to make these inductive inferences. And one way that you could have this kind of inductive bias would be to have uh, innate grammatical uh, friars. And, uh, and there, I think the, the evidence with language models is way less clear and way more tentative. So there, there is a little bit of, so the problem being that the large language models, the giant ones that actually feature before, they learn from order of orders of magnitude more words than <laughs> children's children do. Um, there are a few papers that went from, from Zheng and colleagues from 2021, and there is a more recent one from the authors, uh, training models with between a hundred million and a, uh, uh, sorry, 10 million and a hundred million words, which is uh, roughly what a, what yeah. a child would get by the age of six, eight, 10 years old. Yeah. And they show that actually you can get a lot of yeah, learning. Yeah, I just saw a paper structure. with a title like this. It was like, even when trained on a normal amount of data, language yeah. models still replicate, yeah. Yeah, and so and so what one of these papers shows that what you get when you train them, you keep training the model on X to R words is mostly, it mostly pertains to things like common sense knowledge about the world and semantic stuff, but not yeah. so much the syntax stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe negation would be an exception, but, right. uh, yeah. but that's uh, what isn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there is this, this, also this project that I'm really excited to see the results, the baby LM challenge from yeah. Alex. Yeah. Alex Forster. Forster. Yeah. 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 Um, and so this, the same kind of challenge so they use this, they, they created this corpus that's corpus of child directed speech that's actually mm -hmm. recorded from real real life, uh, childs, uh, the kind of words they hear, the sentences they hear. And there's a hard version of the challenge where you have to train language model on, on, on only 10 million words, I think, and an yeah. easier version on a hundred million words. And people will submit their contributions and I think the results will be announced in mean, August or later. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that kind of projects could, in my opinion, constrain hypothesis in theoretical linguistics and maybe go against the weak version of the property of the stimulus and say, look, like maybe you don't need linguistic, like syntactic, uh, in it knowledge. Mm -hmm. Uh, but even if that's the case, I think, still think, you know, um, uh, 
that just means that there is no amount of, of init structure or inductive bias whatsoever, because after all, you know, language models are not tabula rasa. They have inductive right. biases. Just formulas have right. inductive biases. Uh, and even if these are not language specific, I think that's a key difference with what Chomsky would say. He would say, well, you need this right. language specific uh, right. inner knowledge. Uh, there is a sense in which the moderate empiricists meet halfway with the moderate nativists to yeah, say, yeah, yeah. there yeah. is some like, there are some inductive biases that are not, that they're like general, they're domain general, they're not uh, language specific, right. and we can be happy with that. So, right. Yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's a, a great point. And I think I agree with that. Like I, um, yeah, I mean, I also just in general, probably just a general rule of science is like the putting something up as a choice between two extremes is like always detrimental, right? Like, and sometimes it can prevent people from working on the problem because they're like afraid of pissing off half of the field. Um, but yeah, I, so I had, to, uh, I like these, I, like one thing I was, um, thinking a lot about, or what I was thought about with reading, um, Steve's response is again, the kind of, um, just him on the mechanistic stuff. Like to me, it seems like the answer kind of hinges. And I guess this is a different version of the question, but it seems like a lot of it hinges on what the model is doing internally to process these to process the language, like whether it represents something that looks like Chomsky syntax or not. Be but I guess this is a kind of a different question. So there's, a, there's the kind of what you were describing, which I think is definitely like one of the important ways to be thinking about this problem from kind of a linguistics perspective, which is like, take the blank slate language model and say, how much data does it need to learn? Because it's definitely a super um, significant finding if you could replicate, if like a transformer, randomly initialized transformer trained on a realistic amount of child-directed speech learns syntax, like that's a huge finding, right? Um, there's also this kind of like, take the giant pre-trained language model um, trained on a way more data than a human has, but then you can kind of use that as the starting point. Like that's the innate structure that a human has, right? Which could be a ton of language specific and uh, uh, syntactic structure. And then that's kind of what, um, and then I, from that point on, then it's quite uh, efficient. It's the problem. So that's kind of what my first thought when I read Steve's paper is like, well, we can't really say because we don't know whether the model has solved the language problem by learning some like nice looking formal syntactic, abstract syntactic structure under the hood or not. Although I think a lot of data suggests that it has. Um, but I guess it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer because you can't do something like, um, you can't then take that as the starting point of a language learner because it's already learned a lot of language. Like you would want some other way of like inducing that structure, but then stripping out the ability to actually generate language if you wanted to try to replicate. Like you would want to like find a way of like pre-training the model, getting all the innate syntactic structure, right. but then somehow reinitializing a large part of it so that child would have to relearn and then use that as to, to ask whether what the language model has learned is something akin to the innate structure that Chomsky would have wanted. I also, yeah. I mean, I guess something you could do, because you mentioned like learning unlearnable languages is like try to transfer a pre-trained language model to one of these unlearnable languages. Because I, like, I always think of the, I've been thinking of the pre-trained language models as kind of the like that's whatever is endowed by evolution or something. That's the starting point. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And so, but yeah, I, I recognize that it's kind of impossible to use as a model of a pre-linguistic child because it has way too much language to do any interesting experiments on its language learning. But you could ask whether you could transfer it to one of these unlearnable languages and whether it basically needs to unlearn and relearn as basically like if it can transfer too well to one of these other languages, that I guess would be a data point against that structure being the kind of structure that kids have born in. Whereas if it, like their models are very powerful, but what it might need to do is basically unlearn everything and then relearn the new language from scratch. Um, right. And then that would suggest that it's like not, yeah, it's not actually very learnable to the models once they've been pre-trained with this strong bias for other structures. Right? Yeah. Although you need to show that uh, humans, that this, this, made of languages are actually unlearnable by humans. Right? That's true. <laughs> right. And that's right. hard to do because you can try with adults and then it's like an L2 that's problem, true. like a second language. But if yeah. you want to try with the first language, uh, 
if right. that's how you're setting the, the, you know, if you think of pre-training as like evolution, right. Uh, and then you could say, well, whatever is done during pre-training could be the inex structure of Chomsky. And yeah. so then you would need to actually, you know, it's an impossible experiment to do. You need to, right. uh, very unethical. You have to have a, right, a right. child grow up in this. You know. this uh, so, cause like, what is the data that those languages unlearnable is that no language has the features that this language has? I think so. They have this weird, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I haven't done a deep dive. And I think it's yeah. very controversial. So a lot of people were right. convinced by that paper. Uh, Chomsky right. really latched onto that as, you know, hard evidence that we can learn nothing from right. language models. But, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking out of my domain, but I, so I would defer to someone who studies this, but my, I see why it's controversial, right? Because there's like perhaps lots of explanations for why languages share common features other than those are the only possible features for the human mind to yeah. learn or something. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And there's also, you know, there is some evidence, I think, you know, that some people who are not very changed in linguistics always point to evidence across languages where it seems that um, some of the features of generative grammar seem to work better for some dominant languages than others that some languages that right. throw a wrench into it. And then the standard move sometimes is to just add some kind of ad hoc thing to the generative grammar yeah. to compensate for that, but then it becomes a little less elegant and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, those evolve yeah. perhaps as a, as a yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, it's kind of an, an or tangential point, but I guess there isn't as much work on these large language models in other languages, right? Like, I mean, there, there are multilingual models and stuff, but that's definitely some data points that would be good to know. Like we talk about transformers having some they do have inductive biases and things like, I don't know how well they work for other languages. I've never seen a good controlled experiment because just the quantity and quality of data we have in different languages is like so varied that you just can't say anything when the models are better or worse. And, um, but that definitely seems like if from the perspective of asking what do these models mean for the Chomsky and program or universal grammar and stuff, like it seems like we need data on how they work in cross-lingually. Yeah. And uh, there is this work by uh, Stephanie Chan, goes from DeepMind, that looks at the, how the data distributional properties, the properties of the, of the training data influences, yeah. I think, in context learning and transformers. But so they, they look at that with made up data sets uh, that yeah. have different distributional, distributional properties. And they find that the, the, the typical distributional properties of languages that seem to actually be, there is work showing that is you know, there's a Zipfian, uh, mm -hmm. Zip, Zip slow applies across, across basically every human language. And mm -hmm. so it seems that there's something in common in the distributional properties of all human languages that transformers can latch on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily there's still lots of stuff to think about. Like, I feel like sometimes it's like, oh, all the problems are being solved. These models keep coming out and doing all the tests. And it's like, oh God, no, there's so many. Like, I think we still have careers ahead of us. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And in the way it's NLP good because, you know, people yeah. freak out about uh, the fact that all the big models now are being trained by industry and therefore it's taking away from academia. But I think all of the, a lot of the interesting problems are actually things you can only do on small models anyway, like mechanistic oh, yeah, totally. And So Absolutely. in a way there is a nice division of labor. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I've, like, I work uh, at Google 20% and I've said a couple of times, like, all my most interesting projects are the ones at Brown, because, like, I actually think the small toy data things, like, that's where I feel like I'm learning stuff. I'm like, ah, it makes sense. That's how things work. Like, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I I feel good about academic work on this stuff right now. Maybe that's an optimistic note to, yeah, kind of, to end on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. That was, awesome. that was really, awesome. This is really fun. fun. This is a lot yeah. of fun. <laughs> yeah, we killed a, I guess I have my timer going almost 75 minutes. So it's pretty impressive. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tim. <laughs> Hi, Tim.